This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of different kinds of classes for people who are either looking into being a little bit more creative or just curious people who wanna learn some new skills. Among these are everything from illustration, photography, graphic design, even things like UI and UX design. Personally, photography has been a huge help for me. I was always pretty terrible when it came to lighting up my sets and all, whether it's my streaming or my video. So learning about three-point lighting, learning about what is the key light, what's the fill light, working with color temperature, all that stuff was extremely helpful in getting everything set up properly. The whole site is video. Hello everybody, my name is Bricky, currently running from the law for accidentally saying kick the baby, and a lot of you know that I am a very big fan of Dead by Daylight. I have over 1300 hours in the game, I have every single killer, Prestige 3, and a smattering of levels across most of the survivors. <laughs> I've played the game a million times on stream, and I have my own little Dead by Daylight case file series, my own series about each and every single one of the killers, which uh, was quite fun, though I don't do them anymore, but uh, they were quite popular for me, and uh, they were actually quite a lot of fun uh, when I did make them. You could say that I'm a pretty big fan of Dead by Daylight, and I never actually did a legitimate review of the game, as is the nature with most of these ongoing games. You know, it's a little bit difficult to create a review for a game that's constantly changing, in which the review might become obsolete in about two months or so. That being said, I'm just going to do it anyway. The goal is simple. Create a review that will be able to actually be objective enough and go through many things like the mechanics, the gameplay and monetization, the audio, all that kind of major stuff, and keep it as objective and fair as I possibly can and not spend too much time on things like balance and all until we get to that section of the review and also call this the Dead by Daylight 2021 review because right now when it comes out, it's going to be about mid-December. December in 2020, but the final patch has already come out, and therefore, for the, at least for the first few months of 2021, this will be a relevant review, and hopefully a fair enough review that even a year later, you can still look at this and be like, oh yeah, no. This is this is still this still works. This is still fair. So this review is going to cover a lot of the base mechanics, gameplay, audio design, all the major integrated stuff into Dead by Daylight. Then we're going to be talking about old DVD versus new. We're also going to be talking about the ongoing support, new additional killers, as well as cosmetics and survivors. And we'll be touching on a little bit of the last patch, the twins patch, because I had to rewrite a lot of my script due to that patch, because I have a lot more things to say about that one. And hopefully the things I say will stand the test of time and still be relevant months to possibly a year later. So with that, let us just immediately jump right into it faster than a young teenager kicks a small adult. Dead by Daylight is an asymmetrical, horror-ish, competitive, multiplayer-style game that pits four survivors, kind of a younger adult characters, besides old man Bill and Tap, and a more 80s-style slasher horror flick killer. You all spawn in a little zone known as a trial, and these trials are taking place from different kinds of maps based on each killer, and the goal is very simple. The survivors have seven generators across the map, and they need to repair five of them to open up these big-ass exit gates and escape the game. The killer, very simply, needs to kill all of them. Wow, I know, we're going into full quantum physics right now. The killer serves this dark god called the Entity. It's like a spider Cthulhu, right? And the main point is to sacrifice them to their dark god. So what you do is you go up to a survivor who is in a nice, healthy state, and you whack them. And then they become injured, they start bleeding, they start making huh, huh, huh noises to show that they are injured. And then if you smack them again, they become downed. And then from there, you can pick them up, put them on your shoulder, carry them to one of many meat hooks, and slap them onto it. If they spend enough time on said meat hooks, they will therefore be killed and sacrificed to the entity. When you are killed, you don't come back for the rest of the trial, and your friends are left without you. As for survivors, what is your main goal? Well, I already mentioned the generators, but how do you do them? Simple. Go up to a generator and hold, hold mouse one, and you just wait there the whole time. The generators take quite a bit of time to be completed, and they have little skill checks that'll pop up where you have to hit your spacebar 
bar or whatever your button is at the right time in order to get some more progression and not cause it to blow up because generators apparently have quite the risk of blowing up in this game. And during this period of time, you're going to be wanting to avoid the killer. Now, the killer has kind of this weird heartbeat sound and the louder it gets, the closer they are to you. Your job is to use the various aspects of the map to get away from the killer while the rest of your friends work on generators and such. The killer is almost always faster than you. And if they're not faster, they have ways to make themselves faster or to mitigate that. And because of that, you need to use the environment to your advantage. These are little vault windows that you can jump over really quickly and the killer takes longer to go over. These are pallets that you can drop down in the killer's face to either stun them or at least block off an exit so that forces them to break this pallet once again, causing time. You can hide in lockers so the killer maybe won't be able to find you. And your other survivors can help you out as well. They can pull you off of said meat hook that I mentioned earlier. They can heal you back to being in the healthy state. And they can also help, you know, mitigate problems with the killer by using special perks or add-ons to maybe save you from his clutches and a smattering of other options. Combine this with some special powers that the killers have. For instance, the trapper can place down bear traps that you can get stuck in. The hillbilly has a chainsaw that can instantly take you from healthy to downed in one second and also sprint across the map. Or perhaps someone like Freddy Krueger, which is, has the ability to teleport to generators and cause weird shenanigans by putting you in a dream state. Going along with that, we also have perks and items. Items are simple. A toolbox to allow you to repair a generator faster. A med kit to allow you to heal people faster. A flashlight to blind the killer and so on. And the perks allow you to do other kinds of special things. For instance, run really fast if need be. Or perhaps you can go ahead and use special things to keep yourself undetected like Iron Will or Calm Spirit. And as for the killer, you have special perks that allow you to either find survivors faster, hurt them quicker, or maybe ruin generators to make it a little bit harder for them to repair them. Combine all these things, mix and match it, and you've got yourself a crisp game a dead by daylight as for the base game the base formula for the past four plus years it generally has stayed the same you got to repair the same amount of generators the killer is always faster and you use pallets and windows to get through however there have been some nice changes that have been going along with it to spice it up a little bit for example the visuals have been improving as the game has gone on however and you'll find this to be the case with a lot of dead by daylight it's a little bipolar sometimes you'll enter it into a trial and the visuals won't look particularly good. This is probably because the map is a bit old or it has its own kind of problems to go along with it. For instance, if you looked back on, say, a Colwyn Farm map, it doesn't look particularly fantastic. It does what it needs to do, but it has a little bit of a old generation feel to it. However, if you take a look at some of the newer maps, they actually look pretty dang good. The Dead Dog Saloon and let's say like the Midwich School both look pretty damn fantastic. And they've actually been updating a whole lot of maps as time has gone on as well. For instance, if you look at a pre and a post Macmillan Estate map, or perhaps the Auto Haven Wreckers map, it's actually a huge difference and it looks quite good. They've also been updating a few other things. For instance, they've been touching the generation they have a whole new slew of animations now, and they look a lot bigger and much cleaner as well. As well as the killer. Some of the killers have some animations they do, and they're very clean and look pretty good. The Blight and, say, the Oni look pretty fantastic. But then you get to someone like the Plague, and eh, she looks a little outdated. Her motions are a little bit strange, and she looks kind of stiff as she walks around the map. I will say, however, that the actual factors that come into gameplay design are fantastic. And this is the part they do the best, and I'm glad they spent a lot of time with it. When it comes to the actual parts of the map that is really important for you as a killer and a survivor, they are clean, crisp, and easy to see. It is very obvious where a pallet is in this photo. It is very obvious where vault points are in this photo. Lockers are very easy to see. Generators are easy to see. Chests are easy to see. Totems, etc. It is very simple and clean when it comes to the actual gameplay perspectives. And that is something that not many people talk about. And I think it's very important to bring up. It's not just things looking good. It's also things looking clear and concise for the gameplay itself. And I will say they do a fantastic job at that. As for the audio, little hit or miss, it's gonna be a pattern, I promise you. Some things in particular, like the actual feedback of the game itself, the opening and closing of lockers, the dropping of pallets, the sound it makes when you actually hit a survivor, all very, very good, nice and responsive. As for the survivors themselves, they're a little back and forth depending on how they sound. Some sound very, very good. They have a decent vocal range to allow for both their hits so that you can hear when they're grunting and in pain, and also their yells when they're placed onto a hook. It's a lot of screaming. 
It's a lot of screaming. Then it can be a little bit weird. Like, I think Ace is pretty good. I think he is a, a great example of someone that does all the different Survivor sounds quite well. Uh, but then you have Steve, who's just got that... He's got that... Ha! A little weird. And then Jane sounds like she's having too good of a time. As for killers, exact same thing. You have, like, the Trapper or the Wraith, which make just some kind of strange noises and make that weird, like... <laughs> It's like getting hit by a pallet cures his constipation. But then someone like the Blight, or perhaps the Oni, they sound really good. The, the sound effects and the voice acting for them in particular are, are really well done. They have a, a lot of great range to them. But then you go play Legion and then you're like, ah, ah, uh, ah, uh. I think the biggest issue with the audio in this game is simply that it's not very consistent. Often if I hit somebody, I'll hear their, you know, pain sounds and pain grunts, but sometimes they seem weirdly omnidirectional, like you hear them in a certain way, but they end up not being in that direction. And in a game that relies on stealth so often, it's very important that you are able to hear exactly where they're at, especially if that you've already injured them. And so sometimes that can be a little bit weird and it can be sent in different directions, and that's particularly aggravating if you ever play somebody like the spirit which relies heavily on sounds and granted while cheap does a pretty good job being able to listen to everything the times the game does kind of glitch out weirdly and doesn't really tell you where it's supposed to go can be super detrimental especially on a killer that relies on it so much comparing it to the launch four years ago is an improvement sound wise in almost every single department but some things like the earlier killers are kind of a holdover from way back when and i think they really should use some updates that being said they kind of are getting updates like the maps and stuff so we might see that very soon but until then you know a little hit or miss but i'd say it's been getting better as time has gone on and the music is fantastic they have a general theme that's been present throughout pretty much all of dead by daylight but they keep on making these new themes and these new custom chase themes for different kinds of killers and they're retroactively doing this as well the doctor got a new one hillbilly got a new one but a lot of the newer killers especially Pyramid Head and the Blight have really damn good themes. However, the meat and potatoes of Dead by Daylight really come down to three main factors. Killers, maps, and perks. Survivors themselves are basically just reskins of each other. Each survivor does not have their own individual ability, which is a little bit unfortunate because while I would like to see something like that, I get why in a balanced perspective because then people would only use the best survivors. Each killer and survivor come with three of their own unique perks. And every time they add a new one, there are another three unique perks to each of the characters. These perks are exclusive for that survivor until you reach levels 30, 35, and 40 through the blood web system, which is basically their leveling system with a cap at 50. And once you reach these levels, they become teachable perks. And teachable perks are exactly what they sound like. It allows you to then unlock that perk on every other survivor or killer that you currently have. You don't get them immediately, which is a little bit aggravating, but you can go ahead and then start earning them through everybody else through their associated blood webs and go from there. Some of these perks are actually pretty game-changing. A great example right now is probably the strongest survivor perk in the game currently, something called Decisive Strike. This allows it so that after you've been unhooked by a friend and you are hit down again by the killer, the moment he picks you up, you can immediately stab him in the back and get right off and run away. It's actually quite powerful, and it's a very good reason to get Lori Strode as a survivor to allow you access to that perk. On the flip side, the Bubba character, he has something called Barbecue, and Chili, which is a fantastic perk for blood point gain to help you level up faster and also to show you where survivors are after hooking somebody. A lot of people say if you get like start with the game, you should absolutely buy Bubba because it gets you barbecue, which allows you to rank up everyone else way, way easier. Maps are also a pretty big deal as well. There are lots of different kinds of tiles and each map is based on one of the killer's backstory. That being said, again, maps a little hit or miss. Some of them, I'd say, are really darn good, especially some of the remakes they've been doing. I think they've been doing a pretty damn good job with how they are redoing a lot of these maps. That being said, there are a couple maps that go one or the other way pretty heavily. For instance, Larry's Memorial Institute can be 
pretty hell for survivors to try to find generators. Uh, however, if you're playing a character like Hillbilly, then that also is quite fresh hell because of how close quarters it is. We're on the other side, a map like Haddonfield from the good old Michael Myers franchise is probably the worst thing ever if you're playing a killer. So some maps can be killer or survivor sided. Granted, I think that amount of killer and survivor sided maps has started to shrink a bit more now that they've been adding and redoing so many of the old maps. However, you can definitely get to a point depending on the killer you play and also depending on the perks you bring where that map can be particularly difficult for you. Also, there tends to be a lot of bugs with new maps, especially. Uh, I shudder to think about what it was like playing the nurse, a teleporting killer, way back when, when they added the Haddonfield as well as the Swamp, where basically the map just did not work. That we're having that problem again, we'll talk about that soon. However, and I'd argue this is probably the biggest part of DBD, is the new killers they keep on adding. Killers in their own right are actually a smaller community than survivors because it's four to one, and obviously you can't play with your friends. But ironically, that probably is the most important part of the game because killers, they're in their own right, fundamentally change how you play each map and how you play survivor. And these killers are quite extensive, and we'll talk about those right now. The Trapper. The classic Trapper. He places down bear traps that survivors can step in, and he runs around with a big old machete. The poster boy dead by daylight, and no, I refuse to make that joke. The Wraith. A sad bing bong boy with a bell and the ability to turn invisible and spook survivors by turning un-invisible and whacking them in the face. Survives entirely on a diet of pallets. The Hillbilly, a man who can run across the map with a gigantic chainsaw and insta down survivors that get too close. Very fast, very deadly, and very ugh. The Nurse, a slow movement speed killer that makes up for it by their ability to blink directly through walls, through pallets, and through pretty much everybody. The most overpowered killer for the last three years, but nobody cares because they take so much skill to play that fighting a good nurse is just accepting death. Michael Myers, the iconic movie villain. Slow starting out, but as he goes on, he can stalk you stalk you and gain more charges to become the uber scary Michael Meyer we know and love by staring at you through a bathroom window. The Hag, a weird cannibalized Wendigo style character that allows you to place traps all across the map that if survivors step on, allow you to teleport directly to them and get some good hits. Very good map pressure, great at locking off an area, very hard to play, and doesn't have a whole lot of meat on her bones. The Doctor, one of my favorite killers, possibly my favorite killer, with the ability to electroshock survivors to allow them to cause all sorts of madness afflictions to them, like screwing up generator skill checks, thinking his heartbeat is near him when they're actually not, fake versions of the Doctor, fake pallets, and most importantly, the best giggle of all time. The Huntress, a slow but first ever ranged killer that allows you to throw giant hatchets to hit survivors from a long distance away way, has a wonderful Russian lullaby, and throws an absolute tantrum whenever she is stunned. The Cannibal, Texas Chainsaw Massacre Bubba himself, basically like the hillbilly, except instead of sprinting across the map and having a pinpoint hitbox, he just swings like a madman all in giant circles, and also does the best Tuscan Raider impression. Freddy Krueger, the main man himself, the ability to put survivors into a dream state to cause all kinds of afflictions, allow him to teleport to generators, slow down survivors, and give you a weird feeling that you kind of sometimes forget you're playing as a child molester. The Pig, Amanda Young from the Saw series, and she does exactly what you think she's gonna do. She downs you, puts a reverse bear trap on your head, and you have to go through a bunch of jigsaw puzzles in order to pull it off. If you don't, well, you know, Snap, snap. The Clown. Ironically fast, this man can make a whole load of bottles that are filled with his own farts as well as a large concoction of roofies to slow you down, blur your vision, and then take off your finger and give it a good old lick. KFC style. The Spirit. A young Japanese girl absolutely bodied by her father. She can go into a brand new dimension through a phase walk, and while she can't see survivors, they can't see her either. So she has to use hearing and different kinds of visual cues to find where they are and give them a good smack easily the character people hate the most. The Legion, a multi-person killer, basically a whole bunch of young hoodlums whose entire purpose in life is to run very quickly at you and stab you a lot. 28 stab wounds. The Plague, Vami Mommy, 
Oof. Running around, puking on everybody to make everybody sick and cause debilitating abilities. If you want to be cured, you better go drink that holy water, but be careful, because then you're going to corrupt it. And the plague's going to get a whole lot stronger. The Ghost Face, a name I just, I just can't stop hating. Not, not the ghost, not just Ghost Face, no, the Ghost Face. Basically a smaller version of Michael Myers with the ability to stalk individual people, but most importantly, the best teabag in the game. The Demogorgon, another licensed killer from Stranger Things with the power to be able to fling himself really quickly and destroy pallets as well as get hits on survivors. But most importantly, the ability to create butthole portals to teleport across the map and survivors can subsequently, you know, rip apart those butthole portals. The Oni, a very angry man who hits you and therefore collects blood orbs to charge up his angry state where he becomes mega angie and starts running around at Mach 5 bonking people on the head. The Death Slinger, another personal favorite of my own, a yeehaw cowboy man that can shoot you with a one-shot harpoon gun and reel you in for the kill. However, get between some cover and you might make that chain break, which is not very yeehaw of you. The Executioner, Pyramid Head, you know, another licensed killer with the ability to create long trails of torment that if you step on, he can send you into just giant cage instead of a hook and take you to the sin bin. The Blight, a nightmarish man with a whole bunch of boils that is an old, old, old man who could run around banging his stuff and, and pinball around and hit people and... And, and then we have the twins, and, and they're conjoined twins, the little, little gremlin dude's actually 20s, a little titty gremlin, and he drums to people, and he goes, and then, he, then the lady goes and smacks them afterwards, and oh my god, there are so many killers. This, I'd argue, is DBD's crowning achievement, is their sheer volume of killers. There are so many of them, and so many of them are extremely varied with the abilities that they have. Some of them are taken a little bit too far. I'd argue that the nurse, who just literally ignores the game, is probably a little bit of a too powerful killer. But often, a lot of the times, some killers come with brand new mechanics that add to the game. For instance, Michael Myers came out and that added the obsession ability where lots of different perks are based around being obsessed with one particular survivor. You also had the hag which came out with totems and hexes, special very powerful perks but are tied to a little totem on the map and if survivors find that totem that perk is removed for the rest of the game. There haven't been a whole lot of extra ones that have been coming out as of late unfortunately uh, besides like the death slinger came out with breakable walls but there hasn't been a whole lot of brand new mechanics added to the game in a bit, which I think is a little bit of a shame because I think it spices it up quite a bit and we could use a lot more. And at this point, I think I've done my best at being objective and trying not to be biased in a large majority of the review. This has mainly just been good old, good natured, here's how the game is like, here's how the game is played, but now I think we're going to be hopping into bricky opinion time, where I'm probably going to be ranting about a couple things in this game and putting some more opinion based stuff on how the game is currently playing now. Controversial opinion here. I think Dead by Daylight is the best it has ever been in terms of content and gameplay design. I've played since beta, and yes, I literally do mean beta, pre 1.0. And the way this game has changed is outstanding and insane for anyone who has never actually played the game way back when. Did you know Sabotage Hooks never respawned? Did you know Bloodlust didn't exist? So some maps had a thing called an infinite where you literally could never catch the survivor? You wanna know why? Because they also didn't have that thing that blocked off a window if you jumped it too many times. Did you know you couldn't kick generators? And therefore when a generator hit a certain point, it would stay that way for the rest of the game? Did you know Survive with Friends literally did not exist and you could not play with your friends unless it was a private game? Did you know that you couldn't close the hatch and therefore the survivor would get it every single time? Did you know the end game collapse didn't exist? Therefore, survivors would just kind of chill at the exit gates or so a killer could stall the game out and they could never leave? Did you know dropping a pallet would teleport you to the other side of the pallet? So all those times that a killer would get a hit off while you drop a pallet, you know, a trade that didn't exist and you would unfairly be teleported to the other side of the pallet? Did you know when they added decisive strike, it would happen immediately? Immediately, the first time you were picked up, you can immediately do it. Did you know that Save the Best for Last and Unrelenting would combine to allow you to have the machine gun build where you could hit survivors faster than they could do anything? Did you know that two killers would load into the game often? 
Do you know there's a bug where any killer could have any other killer's power? Did you know that if the killer disconnected, all the survivors would lose their items? Did you know that if a survivor disconnected, they would keep their items? And therefore, often when they were just about to die, they would quit the game so they would save their strongest items? The game has only gotten better, all right? And looking through blood-tinted glasses does not help anyone in this particular situation. This game has only improved. It is only improved between regressing generators, breaking walls, the addition of the obsession, hex perks, stopping pallet vacuums, the addition of bloodlust in certain situations, which there's an argument about bloodlust right now, but the end game collapse, how they open doors, the hatch standoff being removed. So many changes have done Dead by Daylight justice. And the best version of DBD is truly the one we have right now. However, this is where Bricky begins his rant state. In fact, I was actually going to be a lot more positive about it for the ending part of this video. I say ending part, it's going to take a while. Because this year was a fantastic year for killers. We had Oni, Deathslinger, Pyramid Head, Blight, a lot of very good killers. And some people think the Blight is hit or miss, but I love Pyramid Head, I love Oni, I love Deathslinger. Well, I don't love Oni a whole lot, but I, I understand why Oni is liked. And the Blight looks awesome, even though this gameplay isn't really my thing. But then... We got the twins, and then I had to rewrite this part of the script, because I was going to be pretty heavily positive, and my, my mindset has changed quite a bit. So, let's talk about the last patch of 2020, and what it means for the future of the game. <coughs> Dead by Daylight, I think, is running into a major problem with four particular things. The engine, perk bloat, the licensing and monetization, and its release schedule. Now let me make this clear. I am not a game developer, I'm not a game designer. I tried to learn C++ a few years back, and after about an hour I gave up. So when I talk about the game, when I talk about the engine, when I talk about the fundamental breakdowns of this game, understand that these are theories. I'm not spitting facts or anything, these are not objective. These are opinions and these are theories to how the game is operating and running. I feel like I do know a little more than the average DVD forum user, but again, I'm not entirely well versed in it, so these are theories. Now, a game's engine is like the foundation of a house. Dead by Daylight runs on Unreal Engine 4. Now, Unreal Engine 4 is a perfectly good engine. It's very good. In fact, look behind me for all these games that also run on Unreal 4. Just because the foundation of said game is good, doesn't mean that the house itself was built well. You can have fantastic foundation, but if you build the house poorly, it doesn't necessarily matter, does it? Every time a new killer is added, every time a new survivor or its perks or map adjustments are made, all I can think of are people trying to put in furniture that one will not either fit or just simply doesn't work in a house that is either too small or built poorly. Naturally, when you develop anything in any kind of business, you start with insanely huge, crazy ideas and there will down, 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 down until you reach an acceptable work product in your game. However, I think that that going down part is being forced even farther down due to the rickety and poor early Dead by Daylight engine that they're currently working with. There is a fantastic video of Team Fortress 2 developers losing their minds in the source code of their game, and I can't help but think the exact same thing is happening with Dead by Daylight. This is the easiest way I could find to refresh the goals when switching maps to do. This is dumb. This isn't particularly efficient. Too bad. So often, killers, perks, ideas, concepts seem so awesome and exciting and different and they always get whittled down to something a lot more boring and lacking of substance. For instance, I don't think any of us thought that Legion was going to be run fast and stab. When you saw this promotional teaser, you truly thought it would be much bigger and much more interesting. However, again, He's just run fast and stab. Apparently the Death Slinger originally was supposed to be able to fire his gun at different things of terrain and reel himself in so it allowed him to have some map pressure and make him move a lot faster. But that was cut for what I can only assume was due to limitations with the engine. Not only that, but every single patch of the game adds more and more bugs. There are always so many bugs. And a lot of times bugs happen because the foundation of said game wasn't established properly and things that were added constantly are crossing and 
causing problems with other aspects of the game. And that's why random things happen. Like you'll add a character and then a totally random character has a huge bug because their addition crossed paths with something else and now there's a problem. This moves into the perk bloat problem as well because I've found that very often, and I mean very often, there is a fundamental issue with the gameplay and the balance of Dead by Daylight and a perk comes out very quickly afterwards that can fix that particular problem instead of actually adding an in-game change to it. Now this isn't always the case. Bloodlust was added, that's great. Kicking Generators, also great. They had the end game collapse, all fine things, right? But then you look at all the other examples. Survivors are swarming the hook too often after a killer hooks somebody, barbecue and chili to tell how many are close. Killers need a reason not to camp, devour hope. Survivors body blocking too much, mad grit. Gens being done too fast too early, hex ruin, corrupt intervention. Hex totems are being cleansed too easily, haunted grounds, hex undying. Survivors waiting to ambush a killer after downing somebody, infectious fright. Camping problems, again, make your choice. Choice. Items becoming too annoying, Franklin's demise, touching gens too quick after kicking, dragon's grip. And this exact same thing happens on the survivor's side. Killer going after the unhooked player, borrowed time. Killer still doing that, decisive strike. Too much barbecue and chili, distortion. Reason to cleanse dull totems, inner strength. Slugging, unbreakable. Playing solo, kindred, always kindred. Downed after being picked up, Soul Guard. Perks are being added to circumvent problems instead of said problems being changed in the game's mechanics themselves, which causes a huge problem because when every single killer and survivor come out with three brand new perks and you want to circumvent said problem, you have to then buy and grind the killer or the survivor and then grind the rest of the killers and survivors to get the perks you need. I feel at such a disadvantage playing Dead by Daylight without Discordance. Discordance is my crutch perk like crazy because without it generators are completed like mad in the early game and I need to know where people are at and I know many other survivors and killers have those perks that they almost never want to take off because it's so important to them in the current meta of the game Lori Strode is a licensed survivor which means you need to pay for her if you want Decisive Strike, the best perk in the game, you need to buy her, you need to level her up to almost maximum, and then you need to put levels into every other survivor or whatever survivors you want to play in order to even use the perk you got from her. And sure, Shrine of Secrets does exist, but so what? You only get two killer, two survivor perks that rotates every week. Do you know how minuscule your chances are of getting the perk that you want there? Teeny tiny! Tic-tac. And I'd argue that this insane perk blow is because you can't make these changes to the fundamental base game very easily because the foundations aren't working well. The Dead by Daylight developers are not dumb. They're talented people, which is why I can't imagine that this is the route they necessarily wanted to take. Some of the new gameplay adjustments were solid. Obsession was kind of cool, but especially the Hex Totems. The Hex Totems was a great addition to the game and added a side objective. And as perks came out, unfortunately, it's pretty much only perks that they work with, again, adding to the perk bloat, but still, Hex Totems were nice. They give you some points, and not only that, but they can get rid of perks or help with your own, things like inner strength and such. But I feel like this game desperately, desperately needs a side objective. Remember Twisted Tree Line? You remember, remember Twisted Tree Line? You remember Twisted Tree Line? Remember those altars in the middle that would assist your team when you captured them? I really feel like this game needs some side objective like that. Something that you can get, something that you can fight over, both sides fight over to allow you to be stronger in the game and therefore punish the other characters and or players or whoever for not having it but at the moment if you don't have the perks that you need to buy characters for you're screwed if the killer really wants you dead and you don't have decisive strike and your friends don't have borrowed time you're doomed if you're playing a killer with a lack of map pressure like the trapper or the clown or the wraith and you don't have gen stopping perks corrupt intervention hex ruin the game's over in a heartbeat. And this is especially true with the most recent patch to the game, the Twins. The Twins arguably is the worst patch this game has ever had, and I do not say those words lightly. Five out of six of the new perks don't work properly. That's a 16.6% .6 repeating percentage of perks 
that work. I know this. You want to know why? I play Warhammer. D6s are my life. The twins have more bugs than the entire game of Hollow Knight. Victor will get sunk halfway through the map often when he is released, therefore making him stuck there and he can't even attack. He barely functions when he goes over any kinds of windows or pallets. He lands on areas that you can walk on but are apparently considered no-go areas and he just straight up dies. He flies away when he returns to your body, which I will admit is quite funny sometimes. Oh, and we haven't even talked about the hitbox problems either. Oh. That he won't... He... Okay. The new Auto Haven has square hitboxes. Square hitboxes on areas where said hitboxes should not be going through. If there is any bigger sign that this patch was not finished in the slightest, that's it. I cannot play Deathslinger at all. One of my favorite killers on this new map because the hitboxes are that atrocious. I am firing through air. Air. Also, the known issues part of the patch, the known issues, these are known, is bigger than the patch itself, or at least damn close to. How can this many known issues still be here? I get it, bug fixes are hard. You know, it's, it's difficult to fix bugs because you have to figure out why it's happening and you gotta figure out a, a workable fix for it. But then that's the question is, why did it come out like this? Every single patch, the bug fixes section is always larger than the patch itself. Every single time. And I only imagine that they were released like this because of an extraordinarily tight release schedule, which goes along with the licensing and monetization part. So when I say this, it creates the uncomfortable situation where when I talk about behavior, I have to talk about the company as a whole, because I don't want to point out a specific developer or make them think I'm talking to them specifically. But unfortunately, someone in behavior as a whole is in charge of this kind of thing. And whoever it is, you royally fucked up. This is a terrible patch. This is arguably like one of the worst ones this game has ever had. It was released massively unfinished. And again, the reason I say this is because I know there's a ton of developers here, a ton of fantastic people who probably voiced their concerns. I can't imagine some of the people who were part of this that did not voice their concerns on this new patch. There is no way, because after meeting these people, there is no way in good faith they were like, yeah, this is good. We'll release it like it is. There's no fucking way. And so my only assumption is one of two things. One, it is the end of the year and they have shareholders they need to impress, okay? It is the end of the year. This is pretty much the final patch and they need to get this thing out ASAP to make a whole bunch of more money, sell a bunch of Christmas cosmetics, and they have to just weather the bad press because they have shareholders they need to please. They are the invisible hand that moves the game industry. A lot of times when you wonder why, why, why with a monetization side, it's normally those stockholders, those shareholders, those that invisible hand which I imagine is why the monetization of this game has been getting so abhorrent lately. They release a patch this absolutely unfinished, this absolutely terrible, because they need to get a new killer, a new survivor, and a bunch of new Christmas cosmetics. But at the same time, if this wasn't a constantly evolving licensing cost, if this wasn't consistently costing them or looking for shareholders, they could easily release all the Christmas cosmetics and not release the actual patch yet. The art team and the development team are two different people. They could release all the Christmas cosmetics, but then keep the twins and such back, at least delay a little bit to allow them to, you know, work on all these horrible bugs. And I have a feeling that this is a model with all of these licensing costs that just can't last. And the monetization of this game shows that. The game itself is an upfront $20 purchase, but then you only get five, count them, five of the survivors and associated killers out of the 22 killers and survivors there are. If you want the associated killer and survivor, you need to pay just about $7 per DLC. I did the math. If you wanted every single DLC for the characters, not including any cosmetics, as well as the price of the game, it is $145 to have the whole game. Now, can you unlock them with in-game shards? Yes, you can. 
It takes about 9,000 of these things called iridescent shards in order for you to buy a singular killer. I did the math. It took me about seven and a half hours to get 1,000 shards. Let me just get my, uh, my big math brain out here. 7.5 times nine. Let's see what that is. Yeah, 67 and a half hours in order to get one singular killer. Killer. Oh, but I sure do hope you didn't want to play a favorite horror movie slasher character like uh, Michael Myers or Freddy. Because you can't buy those with in-game time. They're licensed killers. You gotta buy those with real money. Also, there's a $10 battle pass that they have every couple of months. And there's also a skin shop which uh, some of them you can actually buy with shards as well for even more than the killer. And some you can't for no apparent reason. Just, you know, throw it at the wall, see which ones you can and you can't. I don't know, man. This might, and I mean might, be acceptable in a free-to-play game. But this is not a free-to-play game. This is a $20 upfront title. And truth be told, I don't know why they'll make it a free-to-play game. If you made it free-to-play, you'd have a much larger player base and probably more profits. Now, Berkey, you keep saying shareholders and licensing and stuff, but how do you know it's not just, like, greed and, like, I gotta want more money? Oh, that's a, that's a fair point. I have thought about that. Um, I mean, hey, I am, I'm far from the person you should be listening to when it comes to, uh, not being greedy. But you'd think they would polish the game more in that case. You'd think they would therefore do as I said earlier, release the Christmas skins, release all those new cosmetics they want to like sell, but then hold the actual DLC back just a little bit earlier. Releasing a patch this buggy, this rough, either reeks of terrible executive decisions or some desperation for some extra money at the end of the year. And yes, yet this is the best state Dead by Daylight has ever been in. In my opinion, Dead by Daylight should be a free-to-play game. DBD is not interested in making $10 here, $10 there from various people. They're interested in whales. This is a whale game. This is the game for the diehard fans who have bought every single DLC, who have skins for multiple characters, for people like me. Granted, I stream it plenty. I've made lots of YouTube content on it, so in reality, it is kind of giving me a kickback. But for the regular people, for those people who are just living their lives and they want to play some Dead by Daylight, this feels kind of shitty. But at the same time, they have no competition. Evolve is gone, Friday the 13th is barely around, and any other asymmetrical game like this just doesn't have the viewer base or the player base. They are the only game, really, right now, of their kind. And this is the reason why the Twitch views are always so damn high. It's the reason why it's so constantly up there, because it's the only game of its type. And for the people who stream this game, I feel for them. I really do. They probably have some of the highest production quality streams on the platform. Some of these people who stream Dead by Daylight have so much going into their streams, so much production, so much quality, so much effort put into it. And I feel for them because I was part of the whole League thing where League was pretty much the only thing people wanted to watch and trying to jump between different games, trying to do a little bit of variety, just tanks everything far worse than many other games do because it is the only game of its type. These streamers, people who I have met and gotten horrendously drunk with and the community, besides some of the forum people, deserve better. They deserve better for all the time and money they've spent putting into this game than to end up with patches and constant releases and a monetization system that are this poor. Go, man, go. Oh, there she is. She failed the test. Don't do this, connect. I was bringing Am I still gonna play it? Yes. I am, because it's very fun, all right? With all of these problems, it is still a fun game, and especially with your friends and Survive With Friends, yes, it is still a very fun game, and you can absolutely have a blast with it. But I'm not gonna like it as much, all right? I'm not gonna like it as much. Should you buy Dead by Daylight? I'd be lying to say if it wasn't fun with your friends. I'd be lying to say if there wasn't a lot going on there. I'd be lying to say that I haven't spent 1300 hours in this game and played it like crazy. I would be lying to say that you would regret your purchase. But at the moment I say no. 
Don't get into it now. As far as I'm concerned, this game needs changes. All right, either to the main gameplay loop of it, or at least some engine adjustment so that they don't have a bug fix or a known issues fix larger than the patch at hand. This might change in the future. In about five months to a year, you might be like, wow, this video is absolutely wrong. Dead by Daylight had a huge glow up. Things got changed every which way and it is a fantastic product now. Or in five months to a year, you might say, wow, this video is still relevant even a year later. Who knows? It pains me to say it because I have spent plenty of time with so many of the streamers. I have spent a wonderful amount of time with the developers and I've only received the best kindness in return. So it pains me to be this negative about the game as often as I am. But this is the problem when it comes to reviewing anything. You gotta put your bias and subjectivity aside and try to say it as it is even if it might hurt some feelings. Thank you very much for watching this video, everybody. I thoroughly appreciate it. It was a pleasure having you all here. If you like, you can check out some of the merchandise that I told you about earlier. We have a wonderful Christmas mug and stickers if you want to catch it. It's only around for the Christmas time, so if you want to grab it, grab it soon, because I only have so many. Or if you want to just get shirts and stuff, hey, be my guest. It's over at Orchidate.com. To all my patrons that are backing me currently, your names are going up on the screen right now. Thank you so much for supporting me and my channel. I appreciate it quite a bit. Uh, you guys help me really kind of, you know, ha have a good stream of uh, income to allow me to be a lot more relaxed and not have to rush a lot of these videos in order to try to make a bill or something. So I really do appreciate you. Uh, as for questions, I only have two, one of them. How are you? You know what? I'm doing great. Um, it's been a really hectic last couple of months combined with holidays, COVID, and content, but I am glad that I'm still doing it. It does feel good, and there's a lot that I am getting done, which also feels wonderful. And then my other question is, what's next? Uh, it's a great one. Uh, maybe Warhammer content, if not Warhammer stuff. Uh, it probably would be some kind of like how to play the game. If not that, I don't know yet. I'll figure it out. Bye-bye. <laughs>